What have I told you that Bardock, father of Goku, and Dragon Ball Minus could both be canon? Now, the character of Bardock would debut in 1990 in a OVA, or original video animation, that we will come to know as Bardock, father of Goku. But then, 24 years later, in Volume 1 of Jacko the Galactic Patrolman, original series creator Akatiri Toriyama released Dragon Ball Minus as a bonus feature, retroactively changing a beloved story and causing massive fan outrage. But what if I told you that these two seemingly contradicting stories could coexist in the same continuity? What if they could both be canon? Hey there folks, now in this video what I want to do is present to you a what if scenario in which both Dragon Ball C, Father of Goku and Dragon Ball Minus, the departure of the Faded Child, are part of the same continuity. What if both these stories are in fact canon? Can they coexist? And what would that look like? Now before I get to my scenario, let us analyze what story beats are actually eligible for the finalized canon story? That means we are going to ignore the games. <laughs> we are going to sure as hell ignore episode of Bardock. No! None of that! Shame on you! But we will take a look at the new Dragon Ball Super Broly movie. Because that is sort of what finalized a lot of the canon, right? Uh, canonized Broly. But also, we saw a screen debut of Bardock and Gine, so we are sure as hell going to take the Broly movie in consideration. But what story beats am I going to remix in a brand new song, which is hopefully going to play a little bit more harmoniously with the expectations of the fanbase? Well, let's start things off with the original OVA. Bardock and his battalion of badasses are laying siege to the planet Kanasa under a natural full moon in their Uzaru transformations. Now, in this stage, Bardock's team exists out of Tora, Fasha, Borgos, and Shugesh. However, these names have been severely changed for in the Japanese version, they were called Toma, Selepa, Totepo, and Pampugin. Now, after the battle, there's this campfire scene in which the team discusses two interesting things. One, why they attacked the planet Kanasa, and to the experience of going into the Uzau transformation, which isn't relevant to the plot for this video. However, I do cover it in my Uzau video. Now, according to the team, planet Kanasa is rumored to have special energy that allows the inhabitants to develop psychic power. These powers entail the telepathic ability to read minds and the power of precognition, that is to say, foresight. I can see the future! Now, the team is ambushed by a Kanasan. Kanasian? I'm gonna go with Kanasan for single. And Bardock is struck in the nerve system, seemingly in the kill spot on the back of your head. And he obtains some sort of nerve damage. Now, the character, even though he's lit on fire, is nice enough to explain that he has transmuted Bardock's energy to something more harmonious and granted him the power of foresight. Just to see his planet die as some sort of weird form of psychic revenge. Now as the alien is promptly dispatched, Bardock collapses and is taken back to planet Vegeta for medical aid. Now this is a stark contrast to the events in Dragon Ball Minus, in which we find Bardock battling on an unnamed planet for unknown reasons with only a single team member known as Leek, which I find lacking in creativity and design, for he's rather boring. Now during this fight, they get a summon to return home to planet Vegeta. What's interesting is they're battling aliens who are using guns, showing that this alien race uses technology and seems to have no knowledge or very little knowledge of battle power or ki, as the Saiyans do. Also, they travel in a spaceship rather than in one of those cool 
controlled cannonballs the Saiyans usually travel in. In their spaceship, while traveling back home to planet Vegeta, Bardock and Leek discuss the reason why they may be summoned back. And Bardock uses his own wits to draw the conclusion that Frieza wants to kill the Saiyan race, showing off that Bardock has more intelligence rather than psychic foresight. Upon arrival, Bardock learns that Frieza's men have been asking questions about the Super Saiyan, which fuels Bardock's suspicion even more. Then he returns home to his wife, where the audience is introduced for the very first time to the character that is Goku's actual mother, Gine. Which turns out is not a warrior at all, but actually works in a meat factory. Rather different, however, was Bardock's reception in the original OVA, where we find Bardock in a medical pot receiving Weaver's visions. Now, because these revelations don't actually carry any relevance to the plot, I'm going to ignore them in this particular video. What is interesting though, is that the doctors in this scene mention that Bardock comes back from every mission half dead. It seems that Bardock is abusing his Saiyan biology to obtain Zenkai boosts to gain a higher power level and climb the ranks of Frieza's force. And this works. In a scene where Bardock isn't present for, Frieza, Sarbon and Todoya discuss the recent taking of Kanasa. They at first believed that it was an elite squad who managed to do it, but they discovered that it were a bunch of low-class Saiyans, and they begin to worry about the rising power of Bardock. I find that Frieza's motivations for destroying planet Vegeta could be found in Bardock's story. However, I like to keep this video focused, so I want to make a separate video about Frieza's motivations for the extermination of planet Vegeta. And besides all that, the claim that Bardock is a low-class Saiyan might not be completely true. For the doctors mentioned that Bardock is overdue a good power reading. It seems that his current power classification, his recorded power level, is actually out of date. And that he probably has a much higher power level than they are currently aware of. And once Bardock is released out of the medical pod, he learns that his team is already off on a new assignment. An assignment of Frieza himself meaning they finally got the recognition they were hoping for. However, what Bardock doesn't know, besides his premonitions, is that he just missed the first bus to his own assassination. Now, after a quick stop to see Goku, Bardock heads off the planet Meat, where he finds a battlefield where the enemies of his team have fallen, but when he looks for the highest power level, he soon finds his own team slaughtered with only Tora as a single survivor, barely clinging on to life. Now it is Tora that informs Bardock that they have been ambushed by Todoria and that Frieza indeed wants to kill him, making Bardock realize that his visions are in fact true. Now Bardock wipes the blood from Tora's face, turning a white handkerchief into a red bandana, granting Bardock his signature look. Much time to mourn, however, Bardock doesn't have, for he is immediately attacked by Todoria's men, which he afterwards calls elites. Meaning that at this stage, Bardock himself is either an elite or super elite warrior. Bardock is seemingly taken out by Todoria, who then leaves to rendezvous with Frieza's ship. So, how did the mission go? Complete annihilation. However, Bardock barely survived. Significantly injured, Bardock makes his way back to planet Vegeta to start a revolution. So, complete annihilation, huh? Now sadly, all of this excitement is missing from Dragon Ball Minus. After meeting up with Gine, Bardock acquires the whereabouts of Reddit and goes off to see Kakarot, who is three years old and still inside of an incubation chamber. Now Bardock informs Gine about his worries, and they proceed to steal a space pod. They program the space pod to head straight to Earth, however they themselves cannot follow because Bardock is worried that they may pick up on their power levels if they were to depart the planet. So Goku is sent out on his lonesome, kicking off the events of the original Dragon Ball series. And thus, Dragon Ball Minus comes to an end. Luckily, not contradicting the original ending of the OVE. Now, what you must understand is that that ending is most assuredly canon. For in the original ending, Bardock arrives back on planet Vegeta and he tries to convince the other Saiyans to join him in a rebellion against Frieza. 
However, they don't believe him and he sets off well injured on his own, battling a large amount of Frieza soldiers before getting sort of captured. Frieza then creates this huge ball of energy and wipes Bardock and the entire planet from existence, destroying the proud Saiyan race in one foul blow. Now, even though some of the details might be different, this ending is canon. Originally, in 1991, Toyama himself included two panels of a flashback Frieza was having to this particular event. When Frieza saw Goku, he remembered Bardock because Goku looks a lot like his father. In two panels we see Bardock, drawn by the hand of Akira Toriyama himself, being destroyed by Frieza when he blew up the planet. And in the new Broly movie, we too see Bardock fighting against Frieza and die with the rest of his planet. So this ending has always been canon, even though it wasn't in Dragon Ball Minus. Great, now that we have re-familiarized ourselves with the two stories, how can we possibly make them fit? Now I was actually quite surprised to find out that there is actually a huge time gap in Dragon Ball Minus where certain parts of Bardock's original special would fit. For in Dragon Ball Minus there too is a scene where Bardock isn't present for. In this scene Frieza is informed about the legends of the Super Saiyan and his henchman informs him that within a realistic amount of time, a month period, most Saiyans would have returned home but for all Saiyans to return home, it will take more than a month. Upon which Frieza responds that he cannot wait that long and that all Saiyans will die within a month's time. A month. A whole month? Dude, have you any idea how much time that is? I mean like, the time it takes from Cell to awake out of his little lar form and you know, die by the hands of Gohan happens in like two weeks period and the time it takes for you know Bulma and Krillin to land on planet Namek and then for Frieza to blow up the planet that happens in like a week slightly more than a week period so you have you any idea how much story can happen within one month of, of this universe it wouldn't be very difficult to fit these two stories together with this time gap in mind Okay, now let's get into the scenario. How would the exact sequence of events go down if these were in fact one and the same story, part of the same continuity? Now, before I can get really started, it's just one tiny little huge big out of proportion topic of debate everybody's having. The age of Goku. How old must Goku be? In the original story, he is a baby. Now, he doesn't seem to be a just born baby. But he can't be much than a year old. I mean, it takes some time to get from planet Vegeta to planet Earth. So he ages in that travel time, I presume, unless the pot puts him in some sort of aging stasis. But of course we know that he was a baby when Grandpa Gohan found him, because that is what Roshi told us. However, in Dragon Ball Minus, he's already three years of age, and he must still travel to planet Earth, meaning that he could be four years old when he arrives. Now I'm going to be absolutely frank with you, if it was left up to me, and in this particular scenario it most assuredly is, then I would have him be older. Listen, expecting a baby to transform into a Godzilla gorilla and conquer an entire planet is stupid, the kid can't even wipe his own ass yet. With Gohan at least, he was 4 years old when he was left in the wilderness and he could transform into an Uzaru. Now I myself worked with toddlers when I worked an internship in a kindergarten and I can tell you that the difference between a 1 year old and a 4 year old is night and day. A preschooler can walk, he can talk, he can use the potty. A baby can do nothing but whine and piss himself. <laughs> so to me it makes a lot more sense that they are actually older when they are sent off. 
Now then, why would Master Roshi call it a baby? Um, well, Master Roshi is like over 300 years old. The guy is has always been speculated to be immortal. And we actually found out that he has obtained some sort of mystical form of biological immortality. Meaning he doesn't age through some sort of mystical herbs in Dragon Ball Super. So perhaps from Roshi's perspective, he was just a baby uh, figuratively rather than literally. So no, I'm going with the toddler rather than the baby in my version. Okay, now what would the story look like if we would just put them together? Now that we've gone over the entire story and we've gone over the sort of problems, how would it fit together? Here is my version. What I would do is I would simply cut two stories in two and sort of uh, weave them together. So the story would actually begin with planet Kanasa. Bardock and his team of badasses would still be the same characters, would still involve everybody and they would still be undergoing these hardcore missions to try and obtain a higher power level. So we start off with planet Kanasa, however he will not obtain psychic powers, he will not see the future. None of that is important for the story and we're going to completely leave it out. So Bardock is ambushed and he does obtain a spinal injury However, this was meant to kill. However, because Bardock is a Saiyan, according to my blue marrow theory, they would have a more rigid spine, a thicker spine. So it didn't actually kill him, but he was knocked unconscious. They return home after this incident and Bardock is hospitalized. But when he gets out of the hospital, his team isn't immediately sent on a new mission. Now, all of this will take place way before Dragon Ball Minus. Alright, so in terms of the time period, we are way before Dragon Ball Minus, maybe even a couple of years. Now, Bardock will then, from the hospital, return home. Why? Well, this is a bit of just, you know, fan fiction, but I like to mention that after a brush with death, Bardock returns home to Guinea to, you know, celebrate life, if you catch my drift. Turns out, however, during his last celebration, they made a birthday boy. Guine is pregnant. Now she's either pregnant still or she has already given birth to a very young Goku who is currently in an incubation chamber. Now which one doesn't really matter. It just depends on how long was Bardock gone for. Now I don't imagine that he's gone for years at a time for the sort of strike missions. It would take some travel time of the pod. But you know space travel is pretty fast in this universe. So maybe she's still pregnant meaning he was only gone for a couple of months. But Gine, you know, she's angry at Bardock for putting his life on the line like this. Now, Gine has a very soft and cute personality. However, I like to imagine that she does have an angry side because Saiyans love sort of hardy women, women with attitude. And I like to imagine that Gine is a very soft character, but if she gets angry, she gets angry. You know what I'm saying? You know, she is the big bomb at the end of a very long fuse. And Bardock knows not the mess with angry Gine. So Gine convinces Bardock and makes him promise that he will live long enough for his son to meet him, you know. So Goku must grow up and get out of the incubation pod and Bardock must be able to tell him, you know, I'm your father. That's what she wants. She wants Goku to know her father. So Bardock promises this and what he does, he actually temporarily resigns from his original team and he joins up with Leek. And they go on scouting missions, which aren't really battle missions, they're just sort of looking around what planets are ripe for the taking. They're sort of the scouting hornets to see where the hive of Saiyans can descend. And instead of going in the space pod, he actually trades it in for this small spaceship and he and Leek go off on scouting missions. In these scouting missions, he discovers Earth. But as he says in the panels of the manga, Earth isn't actually interesting to take. So Earth is ignored as a potential target, but you know, he does report back about what other planets they could take. Now he has been doing this for presumably a couple of years, maybe two years or so, uh, depending on how far along Gine was in her pregnancy. Uh, and then one day we pick off with Dragon Ball Minus when he's on this mission just scouting a planet, just doing some battle, seeing how, how the planet is, whether or not it's worth the trouble. And then Leek gets the summon. Uh, they are to return home to planet Vegeta. 
Now, of course, this is where sort of Dragon Ball Minus takes off like it originally did, with Bardock telling Leek to take off his scouter, they have a discussion, they return home, they learn what they usually learn, and Goku is 3 years old. Now, where is Bardock's team in this time, right? Because apparently they should exist. Well, they do exist. They do exist in the movie hidden as easter eggs across the movie. They are most assuredly part of the canon. Now, what is interesting is that Toyotaro, the official illustrator of the Dragon Ball Super manga, has released a single image depicting Bardock's original crew while they are being contacted by Leek. Leek tells them that they have a return home order, but Tora says that he hasn't received any orders. Now behind them is Todoria, who says out loud, that is because you are going to die right here meaning that the assassination of Bardock's crew is canon according to the official Dragon Ball Z material. Also meaning that Dragon Ball Z is now bigger than Akira Toriyama himself, because we the fans want these characters to be canon, damn it. <laughs> but how will I use them in my what if scenario? Now I like to think that his crewmates were in fact noticed by Frieza and his men because of their conquest of Kanasa, and that they are being sent off on a special assignment. Because they know Bardock asks too many questions, and they know these guys turn their scouters off for their private conversations. So Frieza has taken note of these guys before he decided to destroy the planet, and has taken his time to figure out exactly how he is going to get rid of the Saiyans and you know, reorganize his entire army for when these guys go missing. Now he sends a direct order out to the team of Bardock, but because Bardock is temporarily off the team, Bardock doesn't get the message from his teammates. Now I like to imagine that somebody goes looking for Bardock, some official, and tells him that he needs to go to Planet Meat because it is a direct order, which of course Bardock didn't receive. So this is why Bardock is basically again late to the mission. Bardock arrives and finds his teammates slaughtered and fights Todoria's men and survives Todoria himself. Now when Bardock returns, he would heal back up. Unlike the original where he would set off immediately to go try and kill Frieza, he has plenty of time left. He would actually, you know, heal up. Probably outside of official sources, he would not go to the actual doctor, right? Because then Frieza knows he's still alive. So I imagine that he's actually goes to the slums and finds a sort of off-grid doctor. And he would start a rebellion, Bardock's Rebellion. And he might either go on it alone, having obtained an even higher power level. Or he would actually find some people to go with him. Now in this version, he would have the red bandana. Now, while Bardock is starting a revolution, King Vegeta the third, I believe, takes notice. Now, something I forgot to mention, which is very interesting, is that King Vegeta himself rebels against Frieza as well. In the original Dragon Ball Z anime, episode 78, called Fighting Power 1 Million, we have Vegeta in the Frieza arc, standing in front of Frieza, before Frieza goes through his second transformation. And Frieza is trying some psychic warfare when he tells Vegeta a story he doesn't know yet. He tells Vegeta how his father, King Vegeta, was killed. So it turns out is that Prince Vegeta was on the ship of Frieza in this retelling. However, in the Bardock special and in Dragon Ball Minus, Prince Vegeta is on an assignment because he was bored of staying on Frieza's ship. Now, in this retelling, King Vegeta goes to Frieza's ship, an elite force of super elite warriors, basically a commando squad, and he tries to assassinate Frieza himself. King Vegeta actually tried to kill Frieza. However, Frieza pulls a Saitama and kills him with a single punch. Three, two, one, 
there has never been any contradicting information about this and I would love to use this in my what if scenario. So what I'm going to do is say that Frieza has basically taken Prince Vegeta hostage on his ship and that Vegeta, you know, Prince Vegeta, is just training with Cybermen, but he's bored. Now, he's not alone. He, of course, has some sort of royal bodyguards with him, in the form of Nappa, at least. But he demands an assignment, just like we have seen in the Bardock OVA. Now, Frieza sends him off to an assignment, knowing that he would, in fact, not be on the planet. However, he does not tell King Vegeta. So the King Vegeta still thinks that Prince Vegeta is on Frieza's spaceship. Now, Prince Vegeta takes Raditz and a couple of basically bodyguards, you know, Nappa and some other randos, with him on this assignment and he leaves. And he's actually safe. Uh, but King Vegeta, when Bardock's rebellion begins, sees this as an opportunity to try and rescue Vegeta from Frieza's ship. So he goes off Frieza and commits mutiny on his ship. He kills a lot of men, but in the end, Frieza's battle power was far greater. And he kills King Vegeta and he kills all the elite warriors. And they attempt fails. Then he goes off to kill the planet with his supernova attack. And Bardock is captured, just like the original OVA. And you know, he dies by the hand of Frieza as he wipes out their entire race. And that would be the story. They go on a mission for Plant Kanasa, they return home, Bardock finds Gine pregnant, Bardock goes on a different type of assignment, on a scouting assignment with Leek, while his team goes off and do, does his own thing, they meet back up on the planet when the summon calls all the Saiyans back. The team is sent off to a special assignment to assassinate them because they are troublemakers. Bardock escapes. Bardock makes trouble. He starts a revolution. King Vegeta seizes the moment to try and rescue Vegeta, who is not on the ship, but he is, you know, sent off to an assignment because Frieza is smart and clever. And Frieza kills everybody except for Goku, who will end up being the absolute embodiment of karma. Uh, yeah, it's actually a pretty story. <laughs> a sad detail is that in the movie Bardock asks Goku to remember him but Goku never does and I wonder what will happen what if Goku one day would remember his father if he was actually old enough to have a faint memory of Bardock or what if he contacted him in the afterlife that would be an interesting story as well now two things I forget to mention one Gine must have told Raditz the whereabouts of his younger brother through some sort of secure network, some sort of space VPN. And what you mustn't forget is that King Vegeta could have destroyed Frieza's spaceship at any given time. However, the reasons why he would not have done so is of course that Frieza would have survived and kill him, but if he knew that Frieza was going to kill them all anyway, then what reason does he have not to destroy his spaceship? Because whether or not he knew Frieza could survive in space, Frieza would have been stuck on the planet that he wanted to destroy without a spaceship to leave. He, if he would have destroyed the planet, he would have been stuck in space without any food or water. And he can't breathe in space, so he would have suffocated. So keeping Vegeta on his spaceship wasn't necessarily to keep Frieza safe from King Vegeta, but was to keep Frieza's spaceship safe from King Vegeta, blasting it from the comfort of his own throne room. But that's, uh, that's enough rambling out of me. Yeah, and you will most assuredly see me later. Until next time.